Talk with Lisa. This is uh, October 13th on a beautiful sunny California day. Uh, this is Lisa, your expert hypnotherapist, the one who guides you to evoke, embrace, and evolve. Why? Because you do matter. Today I have the honor of interviewing off-site Ms. Judith L. Wood. Uh, attorney, appellate attorney for immigration. Hello, Judy. Hi. <laughs> I'm so happy to see you. So am I. This is actually, this is an honor for me. Oh, it's an honor for me. Yes. Actually, Shavik would have loved to be here, but she could not get away. So it's just you and me. Okay, that's fine with me. <laughs> um, Judith, uh, you have been known as the crusading immigration attorney. And I believe it was 35 years ago or something, you moved from Los, uh, New York to Los Angeles. Well, first I moved from New York to New Mexico. And in New <sighs> Mexico, I was a public defender. And I also worked for the Supreme Court of New Mexico. I was the clerk, the law clerk for the chief judge of the Supreme Court of New Mexico. And I also was a public defender there. Where in New then Mexico? In Santa Fe. Albuquerque? And, no, I worked in Santa Fe and I also worked in Roswell, New Mexico. But um, then later I came to New York, to, uh, to Los Angeles in 1984. Okay. And the way I have done some research, your beginning was in the performing arts. Right. Um, I was a child actress in New York City. I actually won the Best Actress in New York City Award for a monologue that I did uh, from a play written by Eugene O'Neill, Anna Christie. And um, I was very passionate about being an actress as a young woman. And I was in a number of Broadway plays when I was a teenager. Okay, so we have a an award-winning, not only an attorney, but an actress here, a Broadway actress. Well, off-Broadway. Off-Broadway. So isn't the courtroom almost like state well uh, I was actually um, I was actually in the Yale repertory uh, group um, in New York City and we were rehearsing it I actually played Mother Courage uh, at the Joseph Papp Theater in New York City <clears throat> as a very young woman and um, I felt like I was spending so much time even though it was socially re relevant definitely Bertolt Brecht was a very important playwright but I felt that I was spending so much time in the theater and I wanted eventually to do something that had something more to do with the actual real world in which I was living. It was in the 60s. There was a lot of um, uh, discontent and, if you will, semi-revolution. And I was involved with a lot of it. And so um, I, I felt very good when I became a lawyer because I was actually able to affect change. Whereas when I was um, a, an activist and an actress, I, my, I, was, um, I was at a... Uh, an event in, in Washington, D.C., where we were together and, and with all the Yale students, and we were saying um, something about free, one of the people who was in jail. And I got maced, um, and that wasn't fun. I got tear gas in my eyes, and I didn't give up, but I thought, I want to be more effective than this. I don't want to just be a victim. And I went on the, um, the marches, the freedom marches. I went to Mississippi and I helped organize the March on Washington in 1964. In fact, I was sitting almost as close as I am to you to Martin Luther King when he gave his I Have a Dream speech. So my role as a lawyer is a continuation of my activism and my dramatic talents when I was young. The stage is yours. Well, in a way, um, the thing about immigration court it's different than it used to be. It's changed a lot. Of course, now with the pandemic, we can only appear by phone. Only in rare situations are you actually wow. in the courtroom now. The courts have been closed. And so um, my stage is different. It's more like being an, an actress on the radio. And I was an actress on the radio, too, in New York City. But uh, a lot of the courtroom drama, you know, it has a visceral effect. And you, the, the judge needs to see the respondent, see the lawyer. And I really am looking forward to the day when the courts will reopen and I will be going physically into the courtroom because there's so much exchange, so much human exchange, that body language and just the general vibe from the person, from everyone in the room, that's so important in the discussion of the person's fate. I mean, a lot of these cases are life and death. True. Um, what are the biggest misconceptions that we have about refugees and immigration? Okay. Uh, 
you know, I don't really prepare for these talks, but I did prepare one statement. Okay. Here, and that is that we're all refugees. We are all refugees in our lives. We may not be refugees in terms in the strict sense of the word, but we all make a transition, as you know, in your profession. Yes. We all make a transition, and that transition is usually motivated by pain. We usually don't transition unless there's a problem. And so I think that we're all refugees on some level and that we need to be compassionate toward other refugees rather than just shutting the door in their face and saying, leave me alone. Because that's not quite human in my opinion. We need to open the door, not slam it in someone's face. Because the whole refugee uh, law was written as a result of World War II and um, the Holocaust, and it was a resp compassionate response to the things that people were suffering in Europe. It was a compassionate response. It wasn't so concerned with, you know, the, the, the letter of the law. It was basically, you're being hurt, you're not safe, and we're going to help you. And I think we really need to revitalize that spirit and recognize that on some basic human level, we all are refugees because we all transition. Hmm. In my line of work, I say you are ready for that transformation or that change when the pain is so excruciating or the reward is far greater. Right. Right? Right. So in a way, I understand because even America is a potluck. Everyone immigrated here. Except the Native Americans. Except the Native Who Americans. Been subjected to horrible genocide. Correct. And are still being subjected to it. To this day, do you know that it was not until 1962 that Native Americans in New Mexico were granted the right to vote in elections? 1962. They were not allowed to That's vote. That's far later than women right. having the right, right to vote. Native Americans were not given the right to vote since till 1962 in New Mexico. I'm not sure of all the states. And New Mexico and is New not Mexico part of has the largest uh, population. Except for Los Angeles, there are actually a number of Native Americans in Los Angeles. Right. But the Native Americans in New Mexico, many of them still live on either the, the reservation or the, the um, Pueblo. And I know a lot about Native Americans because when I lived in New Mexico, I worked with them. I was um, the recording secretary for the Bureau of Indian Affairs. So I went to all their meetings and they had meetings with the, the tribes on a national level because it was an important time in the 80s because they discovered uranium on their lands. And so they had oh, wow. a lot of meetings how to deal with this newfound wealth. Greed. And so I got Powerful. a lot to know, I got to know a lot of them. Plus, I was a portrait artist in New Mexico and I would draw the Native Americans. They'd invite me to their parties, to their, I was really, I was part Immersed. of their community and I missed them so much. I missed the reality that they shared with me and the gifts that they shared with me and the humbleness and the gratitude and the wisdom. I'm really homesick for my Native American friends. Aww. But they are another nation. They have their own separate nation. True. True. Even though they are called American. Well, they are Americans. They right. are Native American. Native. Um, I know St. Jude is the patron of refugees and um, uh, the patron of desperate cases and lost causes. Yes, St. Jude. St. Jude. And the movie that was portrayed for you, St. Judy, uh, it came out two years ago. Yeah, I'm really glad you brought up St. Jude, because that is, if I have a patron saint, that is it. Right? And I'm like, St. Judy, St. Judy. And I'm like, you know, there was St. Michael Arch Archangel, Michael Archangel, and I'm like, St. Jude is right. so much of what you do. Exactly. And I take that on voluntarily. Yes. I do, and I'm privileged. I feel privileged, so privileged to be able to offer that to people. So privileged not to need it at this moment in my life. Although I have needed it, I have needed that kind of help in my life. I want you to know this. I bet. And it's that suffering that caused me to have deep compassion for other people. We go through our own suffering to be able to help those. Right, and Indeed. I love it. it. You're going through, you know, these presidential, um, <clears throat> this presidential uh, event, if you can call it an election. I'm not sure. It is an event. A, but I love it when one of the candidates actually gets up and talks about his own suffering, because it's such a a human um, a human experience. Rather than to feel that suffering makes you weak 
and less than, it actually makes you more than because then you're able to open your heart and give compassion to those who most need it. And that's what the world needs now is compassion. Being vulnerable. Vulnerability is one of the key things of connection. Well, I don't think that people have connection unless mm. they've suffered because we are born selfish. You know, we have to survive. We're born and we want to survive. But when we suffer a little, then we know what it's like. And then when we see someone else suffering, we understand, we feel. The whole thing about being human is you feel what the other person feels. So when I, in the movie, when I was visiting um, the lady from Afghanistan, yes. I felt what she felt. I mean, there she was being forced to take these psychotropic drugs against her will. And they were incapacitating her to the point where she couldn't think straight or talk straight or anything. And I really, really felt what she was going through. And that's what enabled me to help her and to finally win her case. And when you say that you went and saw it, uh, you mean the case of Nasibi, the Afghani lady? The Afghani How lady. did they find you? Well, first of all, I am an appellate lawyer. Right. I appear in immigration court regularly, but I consider myself an appellate lawyer. At the moment, I have four oral arguments in the Ninth Circuit coming up. And whenever I do a case, even when it first starts, I prepare it as though I'm preparing for the Ninth Circuit. Because actually, you have to. Unless you've brought up all your arguments at the beginning of the case, the Ninth Circuit won't listen to you. So you have to really think about all the issues that you might be talking about. If the case gets denied and you wind up going on appeal to the U.S. Court of Appeals, whether it's the Ninth Circuit or whatever circuit it is. Okay. And so I was actually hired to do her Ninth Circuit case. Got it. And even though I didn't represent, I never represented her in court. In a sense, the movie is, you know. The way it was movie. portrayed, right. But I knew the judge. I was actually the judge who, this is an interesting thing. The judge who ruled in the case, who denied her case, is actually one of my very best friends. One of my very best woman friends. And, um. We talk about that. We laugh about it. She says, if I had granted that, there never would have been a movie. <laughs> <laughs> I meet with her regularly. She's a wonderful friend. Okay. Uh, so it was that case that literally changed the law in America. Well, the thing is that women, for women to have are not considered fully human. Yeah, we're a commodity. Historically, historically, this is like you know, starting with the Greeks and the Hebrews and. Or, you know, it's not, it's not a new idea that women are not considered equal. I mean, we have to each day fight for our equality. And the same goes for immigration court. So a guy can suffer whatever it is that he's suffering, and he can get it. He can get asylum. If a woman has the exact same experience, they'll say, sorry, but that's not really enough. If a guy is raped and he tells the court that he's raped, he gets asylum. I've done a lot of these cases, and if a guy testifies that he's been sodomized in his own country, the judge will grant asylum, lickety split. With women, well, so what? It happens to everybody. That's the, uh, that's the attitude. And so to humanize, to break through so-called glass ceiling, but this is another kind of glass ceiling, it took enormous strength and fortitude because women are ashamed, horribly ashamed of having been raped. Yes. And nobody wants the world to know when they've been raped. That's how Denim Day came about, right? Right. Um, so we go through shame, we go through guilt, we go through PTSD and all that trauma, and we store it in because we have to suppress it in order to not go against our family members because there is even women who will outcast a woman. Women are worse to, oh, very bad to women, other women. And how do we overcome those challenges? Well, we are overcoming it. We're overcoming it every day. Um, but it takes a lot of strength. I loved it during the debates, the vice presidential debates that happened last week when the candidate for vice president said, you're not going to lecture to me. I've been this, that, and the other thing. I and mean, then she's like so well credentialed. And she, you know, she just like lifted up the dialogue. 
from the basement to the ceiling because she knows what she's talking about. And a lot of us know what we're talking about. A lot of us have tremendous insight, tremendous intelligence and tremendous achievements, but we're so modest. We're so programmed into, you know, deflecting our own personality into that of the greater good, which happens to be the male person. We have to stop that because we are worth something. We are worth something in and of ourselves. The female psyche has something to offer the world in terms of peace, in terms of progress, in terms of evolution. We have to stand up for who we are. And it's not just a matter of fighting against men. It's a matter of sustaining life on the planet. Exactly. Exactly. The evolution continues from a woman. Because we know about taking care of life and promoting life and protecting, protecting life. I remember the first time I met you, you said something about hope and faith. Well, you know, in order to exist in this world, you have to have a lot of faith. You have to walk on water. I believe that we all are capable of walking on water. And in fact, we do, even if we're not conscious of it, because there's so much on our plate now with COVID and, and, and everything that's going on. In order to just get up every day and conduct your life and do what you have to do plus, and there's a lot of pluses, you're walking on water. You are walking on water. Right now, there's so much happening in Middle East. And as an Armenian, there is marches uh, in the streets of LA for the human right of what is happening with the attack and everything that has been going through. Um, what are the biggest challenges and the breakthroughs that you have had to be where you are, to be the voice to so many of us? Well, people suffer as individuals and they also suffer in groups. Mm. And there's a group memory of what happened. So in the Armenian situation, so many people were victims of genocide. Correct. And that memory, even if you haven't experienced genocide because you're still alive, that genetic memory, it's, you carry it around with you. And this is triggers. I've noticed with my Armenian friends and clients, this war triggers that whole event when so many thousands of Armenians were just killed in a few hours. And so we have to... 1.2 million. Not only stand up to the... Um, the fact that we suffer together right and that other people have suffered together but that we can get through it we can actually create a more compassionate and peaceful world together we can yes. and we must yes what is the choice it's like you know sometimes people will ask you how old you are and and the person might say well you know i never i didn't want anyone to know how old i was but you know there's only one choice <laughs> <laughs> And in the same with the same with genocide and the and the suffering that goes along with it, the memory, the trigger of it. There's only one choice, and that is to create peace. That is so prevalent because my grandmother was an Armenian genocide survivor, mm. and she, and when they took them with the orphanage to Beirut and everything, and years later when i was around and she wrote and she would write all about her life and a month before she died she tore it all up oh no and she so said you the oral history of it Did you i do okay. i do but what she said was this was my life does not have to be yours the same thing with my grandmother with my grandmother my grandmother was jewish and right. she grew up in a little chateau in um in the ukraine and on her dying breath that basically she told me about um, having been raped and I've actually never told anyone now is the first time I'm actually saying that to <laughs> it's like her secret and um, you know then she came to this country as a refugee and she brought up four children and she like built a whole she became a diamond dealer without a word of English wow and, you know, she was able to overcome the pain of having suffered what she suffered. And we can, we, that, for, that song that we, a lot of us sang in the 60s, We Shall Overcome, we shall be. it's really profound. I mean, I remember walking through the streets of Washington and other places. I've been in Johannesburg, South Africa, where I taught all the, the African people that I met that song. 
some of them know it, some of them didn't. But just the words of that song, we shall overcome, mm. we shall overcome someday. Deep in my heart, I know that we shall overcome. That's such an important thought to keep in your mind, that hope and that faith that, in fact, we shall overcome. We shall overcome. Not me, not you, but we. The we. Well, me, upside down, is we. Right. If we only remember. It's not all about us. And there's so much strength in, in together collective experience. When people really agree, we can't agree on everything, but we can agree on something. And that gives you so much strength, gives you so much soul strength. In the course of your career, who has been the one that you looked up to? Okay, this is really a good question. When I first came to Los, Los Angeles, um, I had a professor in law school, Hiram Kwan, and he was uh, an elderly Chinese gentleman, and he's, he um, taught the immigration class that I took. And one day in class, he just said to me, well, you're going to change law. It was, I think I had quoted from Deuteronomy, welcome the stranger and right. an angel in your midst. <laughs> and he was very impressed with that. Um, in one of my papers, I wrote that. Wow. And uh, he what said, well, you're going to change law. And so part of the reason I came to Los Angeles after being a public defender, I called him up on the phone one day. I said, I was very concerned about the sanctuary movement in Central America. He said, well, come on. And I came to Los Angeles, and he took me under his wing. And every morning I would meet him at 7.30 and stay with him for 12 hours. And he totally, like, mentored me. And then one day he was doing this impossible case. I was, like, watching him all day long, 12 hours a day. And it seemed so impossible to me. I said, how can you do that? And he said, well, what do you want them to do, roll over dead? And I'll never forget that moment because he kept on fighting. He never gave up. And so I learned, if you don't give up, the other side will. If I don't give up, they will. If we don't give up, they will. And there's a great, you know, um, people all often ask me what my favorite phrase in the Bible is. And I usually say faith is the evidence of things unseen. But another favorite phrase of mine is hinds feet in high places. It's out of Psalm 118. And um, the Lord is talking. And he says, I'll lift you up by hind speed in high places. And I don't know, but if you ever observe deer, hind speed, but I do lately, the pandemic, I come, I come very close to nature. And every day I go to the park and I see these deer and actually I've developed sort of a relationship with them. The <laughs> eyes of the deer uh, speak highly and deeply. Absolutely. And they're like, they look at you like they're saying namaste. Oh, you. they go through the soul. I, I just love them. But their feet, they can climb up these mountains, like almost, you know, vertical. And that's what we can have if we tap into our faith. Faith. Do we have to believe in faith? There are so many people. It's more like faith believes in you. Exactly. <laughs> I was just going to say, there is something far greater than ourselves. And, than ourselves. I mean, in this age, you have all these 12-step programs, right? True. So everyone talks about a higher power. It doesn't have to be one religion or another. Just something that's greater than yourself. Mm. I talk about um, your, your inner power and your higher power. Right. So it's not necessarily about God or Jesus or anything entity. It it's doesn't just have something. to be a name. Right. Because it go, the name is a human thing. It, exactly. it, whatever we're talking we about, labeled. does not need a name. Right. So uh, how do you balance your personal life? I know you have a personal life. You, from being the number one leader created the human rights and being immersed with your clients, your office, by the way, this beautiful painting, you also paint, you create. And I write a lot of poetry. And you write poetry. Is that your outlet? I don't think of anything as an outlet, actually. I don't divide life 
up into segments. Mm. It's oh, it sort of all flows, and my poems come out of my, largely out of my work. And when I was an artist, when I was at some point in my life, I was a full-time portrait artist. <laughs> I would I would um, try to see the face of God in every in every face. I would try to see the divinity in the person that I was drawing, not just the mask that they were wearing. Mm. And now we're all wearing these masks. But um, in, the do in those days when I was drawing pictures, nobody was wearing an actual physical mask. But actually my purpose as an artist was to see beyond the mask that they had on their faces, even though it wasn't a physical mask, and to draw, draw the soul. And because I got really close to the subjects, they would befriend me. And some of my very best friends, lifelong friends, are people who I've drawn. But well, the part of the reason I decided to go to law school is because we get so close and they want me to solve their problems. And all I had to give them at the end of the session was a, a piece of paper or a canvas with their picture on it. So I decided to go to law school. And in law school, it continued. Um, I went to a very interesting law school where um, people were treated as human beings. And sometimes law students have a really hard time in law school. But I loved it. I loved it. Well, you went to a great law school. Yes, I went to Pepperdine. <laughs> right. They really recognized the humanity of each student. And I was greatly inspired by the way they conducted the school. I really loved it. Not only the school, but where it's located, yes, and it's I went like swimming every day. <laughs> oh, you did? Yes, yes, yes. At the ocean? No, both at the ocean, but they had this wonderful double Olympic pool. Okay, all right. I'm going at the ocean. It's freezing cold in Malibu. But no, it wasn't for me because I was coming from New Mexico, which was much colder. So Los Angeles <laughs> in February was warm. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, you know, I have all these papers, and I decided, you know what, I'm gonna put all the papers aside, what would you like to see change in immigration, in our law, in our court system? Well, in immigration court, which I'm most familiar with, although I used to be a public defender and I'm somewhat familiar with criminal court also. Right. But in immigration court, um, it there's an important case, um, Bridges versus Wixon. Uh, an old case from the 1930s in which the Supreme Court said, you know, deportation is banishment. It's wor it's just as bad as death in some sense, in some cases. It's like a death sentence to send someone away. And this, the person who was um, in court was not a refugee. Um, and he was not going to be sent to some horrible place. He would have been sent to Australia. Yet his life was here. Bridges mm. versus Wixen. Bridges was... Um, actually, you know, an important person in the labor union movement. And he was, they were trying to deport him because uh, they said that he was a communist. And the Supreme Court held up his rights and said deportation is a, a fate almost as bad as death, perhaps worse. And I think we have to go back to that because today the judges treat deportation so lightheartedly, like, okay, I'm sorry, but I can't grant asylum to you, or I can't grant adjustment to you, or I can't grant cancellation, for any number of reasons, not necessarily reasons that even make sense to me. They don't make sense to me. So I don't understand why a woman who's been raped, or a man who's had his um, body cut, and who's been um, suffering in a in a jail for years and tortured. I don't understand why we just don't allow those people to get asylum, why we have to put blockades. And then it really costs the system so much because if they have a lawyer that who's worth her salt at all, that lawyer will go to the Ninth Circuit and appeal and perhaps win. But guess who's paying for that? The public is paying for that, whereas the court could just see a good case and grant it, rather than put up obstacle after obstacle after obstacle until the person just gives up out of exhaustion. Mm. But isn't there a whole movement of the citizens who are saying everyone who comes over and we are taking care of everyone, we're taking care of all the ones who are in prison, everything is we are taking care of those who come and benefit from our country. And who do you think takes care of the people in the nursing homes and the people who are? The government. No. Oh, these immigrants. 
Those are the first responders. Right. Guess who has those jobs? Usually undocumented immigrants. People are taking care of people in hospices, in nursing homes, taking care of babies, picking the food that we eat. Yes, gardeners. It in the I mean, just the, the all the essential things of life. These tasks and jobs are being done primarily by undocumented people, many of whom are refugees. We need them. In fact, they are, we taking, need them care, more. They are taking care of us. That is the most beautiful way of putting it. I've never thought of it that way. And I don't know if our audience have or not, but knowing it and hearing it, being validated is completely different because we're immersed in them, you know? Everywhere we go, the workers in front of Home Depot or something like that. Or the you person go to who's the nursing care. Care in, the, in the grocery store. Right. Everywhere. And they fear for their life because they constantly have, get asked. Right. They, they are get questioned. arrested. And now there's this horrible law that's now being activated that if someone has been here maybe even five years and established a life, if they're undocumented, they can be subjected to what's called expedited removal and just sent back to their country with no court. That's, with no court. That's That hasn't been the case until right now. It's being activated as we speak. What can we do to protect ourselves and the ones that we love? Well, if you love someone who's undocumented, you can um, apply for a number of ways of keeping that person here. Okay. It just so happens that um, a lot of the visas are current now. Employment visas are current pretty much across the board. A lot of family visas are current. So if someone has a relative who petitioned for them some years ago, it very well may be current. They have to contact an immigration lawyer because they may very well be able to adjust status here now. I know so many of my friends that their family members are coming from Middle East and what I did was I was checking and uh, surprisingly right now Germany is uh, Germany and Turkey are the biggest uh, the country that has the most uh, refugees in their country right a lot of refugees from Syria go Syria to Germany and Turkey right and of course Syria is this you know really devastating situation and the United States has um, reduced the number of refugees. Um, last I looked it was 18,000 a year but it may even be less. Okay. And that's very low. Because they really need, they are the ones who are suffering the most with what is happening in the regimes in Middle East and everything. Well, I mean, some of these places in the world are unspeakable horror shows. I mean, really, you know, you don't really need Halloween because Halloween is real. Right. And these people are suffering. They have no food. They have no safety. The women are always raped. I mean, I can't really exactly say always, but nine out of ten the women in these places are raped and, and repeatedly raped and gang raped and not yes. given any kind of physical or psychological help. Yes. And yet our government turns a blind eye to that and says, so what? You're a woman. What do you expect? And that has become my mission in working and helping women from Middle East so that they have a voice. And that they can say, look, this is right. what happened to me. Because there's so much ridicule of women who've been harmed in that way and their family rejects them. And it, you know, their whole life kind of falls down the drain. I ha can't tell you how many women whom I've um, had interviews with and I'll, I'll ask the, the, the man who's accompanying them to please wait outside mm. so that the person can tell me what actually happened to them. There are so many who live in castle-like homes that bleed inside. Right. And those are the ones who truly need assistance yes. and help and yes. guidance. Yes. And compassion. And compassion. not judgment. Mm. What is the best book you have read? The best book in my life? The best book that has made an impact. This book uh, by Corey Ten Boom is called High Speed in High Places. And it was written, Wow. Yeah. And it was written by these two German Christian uh, actually a Christian 
person from Germany who went to the concentration camps in Germany because she and her sister hid Jews during the Holocaust, hid Jews in their house in Germany during the Holocaust. And as a result, they were sent to Auschwitz. Right. And one of the sisters died in Auschwitz, and the other one lived to write this book, High Feet in High Places. Wow. So we may feel safe. I mean, just to go back to the German situation, you know, it wasn't only Jews who were sent to the concentration camps. It was gays, it was gypsies. Is anyone who put a Jew in their basement or in their attic, like Anne Frank spent years in an attic? Of course. So you may feel safe, but you're not. If you try to help another person, you may not be safe. How do you safeguard yourself? How do I what? Safeguard yourself. Safeguard myself? Mm -hmm. I, With... I really, I mean, every I lean on God just mm. a thousand percent. My life is about doing God's will to the best of my ability. And that's a real, so far it's worked. <laughs> Trust above? So far it yeah. has worked, really. I mean, miraculously. What is the biggest case right now that it's happening in the United States that is going to make a change uh, for us all? Well, I think we're going to see the biggest case in a few weeks on November 4th. Oh. After the vote <laughs> is in and it goes to the Supreme Court. Which case is that? The election. The He's election. To be president. What do you think about uh, the, the new nominee for the Supreme Court? Well, I've been listening to her. Um, the last few hours, and I, she doesn't say anything. She doesn't. She will not commit herself to anything. And I've been comparing her, her interviews with Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Ruth Bader Ginsburg was very intelligent. Talked about what she thought, gave an insight into her mind and she what she thought was thought. important, and who she was as a person. This current nominee, who I'm sure will get approved because the Senate will vote her in. Will re he refuses to give her opinion about anything. So what is she afraid of? Why not stand up and voice? Because that's what she's standing up for. Well, you know, I've never met the woman. Mm. But I hope I do. I hope I get to argue a case before her in the Supreme Court. And then I'll come back and tell you what I think. Have you ever thought of running for somewhere a higher position? Well, I've thought of becoming a judge, but I, I, I have all these cases and I feel so responsible toward them. I actually have 6,000 open cases. 6,000 open cases. Can you believe it? And I can't abandon them because, you know, each case gives birth to another case. Just mm. yesterday, I was going through my older files and I was looking at one of my oldest files and I said, okay, I got a green card, naturalization, and he's petitioning for some, And so the whole family is a part of my life. I can't just abandon them. But would you not be able to help more? I'd love to be a, a federal judge. A federal judge. Yeah. I don't think I could be an immigration court judge because um, I don't think I could bring myself to um, deport people. And I don't think I would last. I okay. think I would get reprimanded for being too generous. Mm -hmm. But I would love to be a federal judge. Ask and you shall receive. <laughs> I'm sure someone will be hearing this. <laughs> well, I'm, ready. I'm ready. I love that. Uh, things, the law of attraction, we attract it when we are ready, right? And I am ready. And you are ready. Speak it, free it, okay, and allow it to come to you. Okay, good. <laughs> well, I thank you for this time. Oh, I thank you. You know, uh, this has been absolutely an amazing it's you are more charming than what people may think uh, you are so humble you. you are so human so are you and that is the best part of you i am in a book as a co-author with forbes riley and stephen samblis it's a book called one habit uh for entrepreneurial entrepreneurial success what is your one habit that you have? To listen, to really listen. Mm. To really listen to what the other person is saying. 
I think that's the most important thing you can do, whether you're a lawyer or a teacher or a writer or anything, an entrepreneur, to really hear the other side. Would you finish this sentence? Judith Elwood is an attorney who tries to work for eternal values. I wish I could just type the word music. <laughs> um, the best interview I've had. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you. Thank for you. allowing us in your space with your painting, with your generosity, with your grace. And I am honored to have interviewed a woman of substance. Judith Elwood. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for watching. Goodbye. God bless you and may the universal light be with you. Please subscribe below and look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you. Thank you for being here. If you want to check out some of the testimonials that I've got, click right here. But if you want to go back and watch other videos from a week ago, two weeks ago, even a year ago, click right here. See you next time.